And now, good micro commentaries and Greg Morgan presents the Winged Eagle Podcast. Happy Saturday once again, everyone, and welcome back to your Winged Eagle podcast for April 13th, 2024. After a two-week absence due to WrestleMania, we are finally back, and I did bump my monitor before I went live. There we go. Let me center myself there. We're looking good. Hope you guys are having a great day, great weekend. We are up here 30 minutes earlier today because I have an early night tonight at work. So I got just a busy one all day and wanted to allow myself enough time to get into what we have to talk about today because there's a lot of wrestling news and there's a lot of wrestling results and some interesting results. New Japan ran a Windy City Riot last night in Chicago and we have a new IWGP heavyweight champion, which is kind of interesting, along with a lot of good old WWE news. We have AEW news. Of course, we're going to follow up on the big story of the week. AEW airing the all-in footage on Dynamite. We came up here on Thursday and did an hour-long stream just giving my general opinions about the whole thing, but we didn't really talk about Dynamite as a whole. We'll do a little bit more of that today because they are setting up uh, Dynasty here in uh, just another week. I guess it's a week from tomorrow, isn't it? So we'll be talking about that. Plus, WWE had a huge SmackDown last night. So we had New Japan run in uh, Chicago. We had SmackDown run in Detroit. And... We got some answers on who Cody Rhodes' first challenger is going to be, even though it's not official yet. We know 100% who's going to be winning the number one contenders match next week on SmackDown. Also, Tama Tonga has debuted for WWE as expected. He has been on WWE's radar for quite a while. Jacob Fatu has already signed, so we had a feeling that we might get some new Bloodline members coming in either at WrestleMania or or after WrestleMania, and now it appears there might be a Bloodline split. We might be doing Bloodline Black and White and Bloodline Wolfpack, or Bloodline 2.0. Looks like Solo Sokoa is, at least now, the new self-appointed tribal chief, and we'll see how that develops for the rest of the year. And already, a lot of people are already eyeballing war games at Survivor Series for like a Bloodline versus Bloodline match, and how cool would it be if Sami Zayn got back involved in that? So we're going to kind of talk and discuss and unpack all of that, and we're going to talk about some wrestling news. Like I said, I will follow up a little bit on the uh, the all-in footage fiasco from this week on Dynamite. Also, Kenny Omega broke his silence today on Brawl Out, speaking on his Twitch stream or while he's doing video games, and talked a little bit about that incident, which was interesting. Vince McMahon has put his remaining shares of TKO stock up for sale, meaning once they sell, that's it on Vinnie Mac. So we'll talk a little bit about that. WWE had some releases today. There might even be some more ongoing, but some uh, behind the scenes uh, releases taking place in WWE today, along with some production changes. We also have an update on Big E. And like I said, we're going to talk about last night's SmackDown and last night's uh, Windy City Riot from New Japan. And we'll talk a little bit about this past week's Dynamite, the other things that we saw on the show other than the all-in footage. And tonight's Got a big lineup as well for Saturday. AEW's got three hours of wrestling coming at us with Collision, followed by Battle of the Belts. So we'll run through those cards, and like I said, we'll be done in time for those shows to start. For those who want to kick back and enjoy a Saturday night of wrestling. So good to see you guys. Uh, It's a week after now, WrestleMania. One week ago today, we were up here watching night one together. Big, long week and weekend and month, really, uh, over the past, uh, you know, several weeks here on the channel leading up to WrestleMania, then going through, you know, the WrestleMania week and the build and all of the watch-alongs and reviews we did last week. It was a lot of fun. I want to thank all of you again for making WrestleMania season this year on the channel. Very successful. We had a great time. Lots of collabs, special episodes. I think we did six classic WrestleMania watch-alongs in that time period as well. It was a blast, and thank you to everyone who was here enjoying all of that with us. But now, throughout this week, I've been kind of dealing with a WrestleMania hangover, I really wanted to take a couple of days off to decompress, but then AEW hit us with that all-in shit on Wednesday, so I felt like the whole universe is coming up here offering opinions on it, so I better do the same. If you want to hear my basic, raw, initial opinions on the all-in footage from Dynamite on Wednesday, check out my, uh, my video from Thursday. It's up on my channel right now, right on the latest content. You'll see it, and you can hear what I have to say about that. I'm not sure if I'm going to really re- be repeating or relitigating any of what I said in terms of my opinions about it, but we might talk a little bit more about Jack Perry and how all of this could 
hopefully benefit him because if they do all of this and they wind up with nothing when it's over, it's really going to look like the embarrassing uh, regret that mistake that it really turned out to be. You know, I've referenced uh, the the Vince McMahon, Brett screwed Brett promo back in 1997. I feel a lot of similarities between these two because with Vince, he's drawing attention to a backstage fight that they should be putting behind him and them drawing attention to a star working for the other promotion. Vince stupidly thinking that he's going to be the babyface in this situation, and he wasn't. Fans hated him even worse after that interview. And then it backfired, and they fell at, fell ass backwards into the best villain of all time. I don't know if AEW is going to be that lucky with Jack Perry, but there is a chance that that could uh, bubble up into some really, really good heat and potentially, you know, uh, give Jack Perry, you know, uh, a, a character that he can run with, you know, for indefinitely anyway so we'll see that's all best case scenario you know that's if everything is done right and in AEW a lot of times they're not good at doing everything right so I think uh, maybe that scenario is a long shot but it still is a scenario and it still could happen so we might talk a little bit about that and we'll hang out in the chat see what you guys have to say and all in all have a good nice little chat and weekend here so thanks again for being here welcome everyone to the show, let me just say hello to some people in the chat real quick, and then we'll get going on uh, what we're going to talk about today, because this will only be a two-hour podcast max, because i got to get out of here and go do more stuff tonight. But we'll be back tomorrow and Monday, and I'll talk about that in just a second. Nice to see MJ Parker and Tatanani and Spartan Sprinkles. Uh, happy 420. No, not yet. <laughs> I think it's... I don't know where... I don't know where you are, Spartan Sprinkles, but uh, 420 is actually a week from yesterday. Or no, a week from today. Yeah, a week from today. Oh, yeah. One week from now, we'll be doing a 420 Winged Eagle. That'll be fun. Right on. Good to see uh, Chaz Medeiros. We got Jimmy A. from Speedin. Good to see you, my friend. Always good to see you in here. Thank you for dropping that super chat in. Big J, seventh season, is here as well. And my friend Zach Goller is dropping in five. Could we see Bloodline Civil War games? Yes, I just said that. At Survivor Series this year, Rock Solo Tonga versus Jacob uh, and Jacob against Roman, the Usos, and Sami Zayn. Yeah, I kind of just laid out that same thing. Uh, a lot of people were kind of sniffing that out right off the bat, that you're going to kind of have two camps in the bloodline. So not really hard to figure that out, that that's probably the direction they're going in. But uh, if it turns out to be a War Games thing, then hell yeah. And I would assume that maybe The Rock is going to be not involved in this, because uh, whatever he comes back, he's coming for Cody. You know, and so is the Cody and Rock match going to happen at WrestleMania 41 or is the Cody and Rock match going to happen early and Roman and Rock are going to happen at WrestleMania 41? I worry. I worry that Rock could do to Cody what he did to Punk in 2013, face Cody at the Rumble and beat him and win the title and then take the title into WrestleMania and drop it to Roman Reigns. That could very well happen. So we will see. But I think something like that is likely and with Jacob Fatu definitely on his way in, uh, you can see that they're kind of uh, lining up some camps with Paul Heyman in the middle, but you know Paul Heyman's going to, you know, side with Roman Reigns. Now with Jimmy out, if the Usos can kind of get back together, you know, and reform that with Roman, and it's Roman and the Usos and Sami Zayn, holy shit, that would be fun stuff. Sonic plays, good to see as well. Same goes for you, Denny Down Bad, and Luke McAllister is dropping in 10. So Jimmy Uso is out of the bloodline for the second time. I feel it should lead to a bloodline civil war uh, featuring a reunion with the Usos. Yeah, so everybody's saying the same thing, and The Rock being the wild card. Yeah, I agree. I don't know if The Rock is going to be involved in that or not, or maybe he will observe from the sidelines, or maybe get involved in the finish or be the reason one of these two camps wins. Or he'll just set his sights on Cody and then revisit the Roman thing next year. Don't really know yet. Kind of early to tell. But, hey, at least they're at least they're continuing the bloodline, you know, without like a long drought or the bloodline's not going to be off TV for four weeks. They're jumping right into it here. And it was good to see uh, Tama Tonga on the show last night. Uh, we've got uh, who else is here? Try to get these out of the way as quickly as possible. Zach H. We got Jay Lambo and Isaac. Uh, hitting all these. Uh, Mr. J, nice. Got Black Black Rain, Damian Drain, Big Dub, Ben Espinoza, Horror Fields. What's up? We got Jacob, Always Radio. We got Martin. We have uh, Harazadu, Hazard, Hazard Azuman. <laughs> What's up, man? We got Tony in here. Wrestling Gamer 64 is here. Uh, good to see Cherokee George as well. William Cullen. We got Sam Ataba in here. Rodrigo, Justin Fleming, Harry Rice, Josh Garcia, JL, 
Good to see you as well, Stephen Taylor. Everybody else chiming in, welcome. Thank you for being here, and uh, happy Saturday to you. Here is what is on tap for the next couple of days. We are back to our classic pay-per-view watch-alongs tomorrow night. Now, after doing six WrestleMania watch-alongs during WrestleMania season, we need to do a hard pivot here, and we need to look at another wrestling company. So we're going to go back 29 years to WCW, Uncensored 1995. This was the first ever Uncensored. I watched this at home on a scrambled pay-per-view feed. And I watched, uh, you know, the, the Sunday night main event show that would kind of operate as their pre-show back in the day. And they were showing the silhouette of what would be the Renegade, but really teasing that it was going to be the Ultimate Warrior. And then it was not. This is also the famous uh, King of the Road match that got Dustin Rhodes fired. This match led to him going to WWE and, and uh, beginning the Goldust character. And it was a really, really weird pay-per-view. I thought it was maybe their answer to Raw. I remember the first time I saw an uncensored uh, advertisement. It was, uh, I, I was like, well, is that going to be their answer to Raw? Because Raw was like uncensored and uncooked and all this shit. Now they're doing an uncensored pay-per-view uh, where, you know, it's kind of like there's no rules and a bunch of weird shit. And I think I might have only even seen Uncensored like one or two times. Like I've only seen a couple of matches. This might even be a WCW pay-per-view that I've never fully seen intact. Because I can't remember ever sitting down and watching this thing start to finish. And like I said, in my house that night, I watched it on a scrambled pay-per-view feed and just listened to it and uh, have my own memories to share with you tomorrow about that. So tomorrow, WCW Uncensored at 95, we will be up here 8 Eastern, 5 Pacific to watch that. And then Monday after Raw, we'll be up here again for a Monday Night Raw review. So that's what is on tap this week. And also working on some other changes behind the scenes, some, you know, other channel or video concepts and stuff that we're kind of just playing with. So you'll see some stuff happening this year and especially in the next couple of months on the channel. So that's what's going on this weekend. I think in terms of today and what we're going to get into and what we're going to talk about, why don't we talk about some news first? And it's kind of like a smorgasbord of uh, news here. I got a bunch of random stuff and I didn't really write it down in the order I wanted to talk about it. So let's let's just go in the order I do have it, even though hopefully this won't be jumbled. I think it's mostly organized the way I want it. But I think we should start with what is about to be a very historic day in professional wrestling. Now, in my mind, Vince McMahon is already long gone from the business. The minute that lawsuit happened, that was going to be it for him. So the process of removing Vince from WWE has been ongoing now for a little over a year when WWE officially merged with TKO or merged with Endeavor and formed TKO last year, right after WrestleMania. Then Vince McMahon kind of briefly came back into the fold, you know, but a lot of people, you know, feel that they might have just played him and this is the way, these are the things they had to do in order to get him out type of thing. So even though he was largely gone and resigned from WWE for the, the second half of 2022, forcing his way back in at the end of that year with the board member fiasco and that fucking controversy. And then with the merger, he's back in. But I think a lot of that Vince coming back in needed to happen to get the merger done. And then once the details of that lawsuit were let out, you know, Vince McMahon was basically just for you have got to fucking go. And so he's been slowly kind of unloading some shares over the past few months. And now apparently, according to uh, to a new SEC filing released on Friday, uh, Vince McMahon is listed as making over eight million of his shares available for sale, and it should be noted that that eight million are all Vince has left. So every single stock that he owns, every single share, I should say, of stock that he owns is now up for sale. Once that sells, that is it. There is really nothing connecting him to WWE other than the personal contacts he may still have there. But in terms of him being able to run the company, I know a lot of people remember when all this started, you know, and I was kind of lecturing people a little bit because there were so many of the same, you know, just basic uninformed opinions of Vince McMahon can just do whatever he wants. It doesn't matter what he did because he can do whatever he wants. I'm like, no, you know, like to a degree, Vince has definitely had some abuse, uh, abusing of power that has been frustrating. And I thought he was gone for real the first time and he forced his way back in. So I was proven wrong there. But this idea that Vince McMahon can just do whatever he wanted, I don't understand 
how somebody can just blindly think that. That's not really the way business works. It's going to be a process to remove Vince McMahon, but he cannot just do whatever he wants. And so getting him out, it was funny. What was it? A fucking two-year process? A year? It's been almost two years now since that initial kind of scandal broke, you know, in the hush money crap. That was somewhere mid-2022, right? So we're going on about two years of this. And it took this long, different processes to get Vince out. First, he's got to resign. Then he kind of forces his way back in. Then there's the merger. Then they kind of push him out again. Now they're just giving him the Heisman, cock-blocking him, blackballing him. Not only are you not allowed, allowed back in here, we're not even going to speak your fucking name. And we're going to make lots of not-so-subtle references to how much we are pissed off at you on our TV, and even your daughter's going to open up the 40th anniversary of your Super Bowl to make a personal statement against you. We're done with you. <laughs> We're done with you. So now that these final 8 million shares are up for sale, I don't know. It's going to feel good as a fan just to know that that's it. Now, I've, I've always believed over the past you know several months that Vince has gone anyway. It's definitely the Triple H era. There is Vince McMahon, like I've said, as way more fish to fry in his life right now. He's staring down the barrel of a lawsuit, you know, possible some some possible legal ramifications. He's got legal troubles out the ass. Plus, he's pushing 80. I don't think he should give a fuck right now how Dakota Kai is being pushed. Shouldn't really be on his radar. So these fans, these cynical fans that think that Vince is still calling the shots, why would he be? Why would he be? Why would WWE allow that? Why would you be scared of Vince now? It's the same thing in politics, you know, like all of Trump's people so scared to like go against him. Like, why? He can't hurt you. He's going to jail. He's got fucking 91 felonies. He's fucking up Shit's Creek, man. So like, I don't understand how you think he can hurt you, you know? And with Vince McMahon, it's like the same thing. He can't do anything to you. What, what is there to be scared of? Why are we scared of Vince? Why are we worried that if we speak out against him, it could negatively affect my position in the company. These are things that Ronda Rousey has been saying and whatnot. And while I understand that that might have been the case when Vince was there, if I was any wrestler on the roster, even with, even someone with a personal relationship with Vince or worked closely alongside Vince for a long time, I'd have no problem with publicly saying what he did is fucking disgusting and, you know, he's dead to me or whatever. I don't know how not speaking out against Vince could possibly hurt you in the company, you know? I feel like the company, TKO and Endeavor, they have to understand that if their talent goes on interviews, obviously they're not going to want to offer up Vince McMahon information and, and, and say his name and talk about stuff, but they're going to be asked about it. So if they are asked about it, and they're honest, I think that's what TKO would prefer. <laughs> Instead of like tap dancing around, well, I want to see what the who's innocent and just wait till we get all the story... All you needed to do was read those text messages. That's it. <laughs> Just like CM Punk said. Not much else you need to do uh, to determine how fucking disgusting of a scumbag pervert this guy actually is. And uh, not to mention everything that was in the 67-page lawsuit. But if you just read the texts, you know, that's it. So there's not really much to ponder over here, you know. Uh, John Cena said Vince McMahon's got a hill to climb. Oh, he's got much more than a hill to climb. There, Fruity. First name... Fruity, last name Pebble, a lot more than a hill to climb. And so Vince McMahon, once these shares are gone, that's like going to be it. It's going to be, pff, the book is finally closed. I've already felt like Vince is gone. It's already very nice and a, and a euphoric feeling to know that he can't affect the product with his bullshit anymore, but he's not going to be completely gone and you're not going to completely remove that tick dug into your skin until he sells those remaining shares. And once those get sold, once we get confirmation that they have been sold, that will officially be the end of Vince McMahon in WWE. And I would, there's a big part of me that always thought I would be sad when this day came, but there was also that big part of me didn't know that we were going to hear this information about Vince McMahon when he got older, even though I knew he was a sick freak and pervert, I didn't know the extent that what it went to. And I don't think any of us did. So it'll be nice. It'll be nice to read that story. It'll be nice to get that confirmation and just kind of just wash it off, just wash it off. And I, I do like that WrestleMania week and WrestleMania weekend felt like WWE's like kind of uh, like a cathartic process for them to try to move past that. It's going to be hard when you got a Triple H and a Stephanie and a Bruce and all these people that knew and, and worked with Vince so closely. But, you know, that's also goes for the talent and a lot of people in the company, production people, talent, producers, you know, writers, all that stuff that had 
contact or work with Vince McMahon, it's going to take a long time for us to get to the point in WWE where nobody there really worked with Vince. You know, that's that's decades away from now before that ever happens. So Vince McMahon's aura, Vince McMahon's fingerprints are never going to be removed from WWE. It's impossible. It can't be done. I'd like it to be done, but it can't be done. But at least this is a start, at least knowing that once these 8 million shares are sold, we don't have to worry about the motherfucker anymore. And that feels really good to say. So Vince McMahon, good riddance, you fucking scumbag. Let's follow up a little bit, shall we? on the dynamite all-in footage. This was a dynamite embarrassment. That's what I titled my video on Wednesday, and or I'm sorry, on Thursday. And one thing that I've noticed, you know, in the community is that it's pretty universal. There's, there's nobody really <laughs> out there that I saw anyway that was saying, man, what a great idea that was. Uh, AEW really stuck it to punk. You know, they showed what a liar he is and whatnot. And I just think everybody universally agrees that Airing the all-in footage was just a dumb idea. You know, they tried to, at least they tried to make it for storyline purposes, but it was weak and it was a stretch. And what it really came down to was just them being petty. That's all it was. And the footage, like I said, didn't reveal anything other than it kind of backed up a little bit what Tony Khan said and AEW in terms of firing CM Punk with cause. I mean, he started a fight backstage. That's, that's uh, you know, yet granted that wrestling wrestling promotions working in wrestling is different than if you're you know working in a you know uh, the corporate offices of uh, fucking olive garden or something yeah you punch a co-worker you know in scranton pennsylvania at dunder mifflin you know you might get fucking let go but in a wrestling backstage area a physical sport you know arguments happen and backstage fights have happened throughout wrestling all of the time but when this one happens right in front of your boss, on camera, in front of Gorilla, right before the first match of your biggest show of all time is, and you're starting a fight and you're attacking somebody, you know, at least AEW showed, you know, the video footage that they had reason to fire CM Punk with cause. Fine. I'm fine with that because it put CM Punk back in WWE and I'm having a blast seeing him back there. So I'm fine with the result that that created. Fine with me. Also, it shows that CM Punk definitely did lunge in Tony Khan's direction. You know, and CM Punk has been in the octagon before. He has real MMA training, even though he's got his ass kicked anytime he's been in there with a train fighter. Tony Khan is a 140-pound little squirrely guy, probably got pretty frightened in that moment. And so when he said he feared for his life, maybe he did. You know, he's a little pussy. I'm like, well, dude, what do you do? <laughs> what do you do? Tony Khan's really weak. Well, you know, what? The, where do you fucking work? What do you do? Show me your salary. Fuck off, you know? So uh, it's don't, don't be so judgy about that. I think that Punk lunging in your boss's direction, calling him a clown and saying, I quit. If anybody would have done that to Vince, well, actually, I think Shawn Michaels did, <laughs> but I don't think that would have really flown anywhere, you know? So <clears throat> I do see the point that the footage kind of backed up those statements, but it didn't matter. It didn't matter. You know, it, the point, I think, from AEW's perspective was to make Punk look bad, and it didn't. You know, it, it all it did was confirm that, yeah, he should have been fired. And yeah, he did. It did appear like he did lunch at Tony Khan. But I don't think any fan is really holding that up against or holding that against CM Punk. I've always believed that CM Punk is a hothead. He's got a fucking temper and he fucking blows up. And there's been countless examples of this throughout his career where this has happened. You know, and this is just what he does. He cannot control himself. This is if he wants to be such a locker room leader like he claims to be going over and confronting Jack Perry right before you're about to go out for your match. Forget anybody else. It was about to be your match. What was it? I think there were, I forget what the attendance for all in was. I think it was three hundred and twenty three thousand people. Right. Confirmed. So you had three hundred and twenty three thousand people uh, at Wembley Stadium all there to see CM Punk. And then he's going to start a fight right before his match. That does not sound like locker room leader behavior to me, who appeared to be the locker room leader in that video was Samoa Joe, who was the first one to run over there and break those guys up. Chris Hero, jumping over Gorilla, breaking it up. Malachi Black, a part of that. Fucking chaos. Not cool, CM Punk. Not cool. You know, so it's really ridiculous to take really heavy, crazy sides in this, because as much as I like CM Punk and I'm happy he's gone from AEW, I'm happy he's back in WWE. I've loved everything I've seen from him so far on WWE TV, even with him being injured. So I'm happy with the result we got. But you can't pretend that he's some victim in this, OK, because he is not. And Jack Perry's no victim either. Jack Perry comes off as quite the prick as well. But another thing that we have to remember about this whole thing and the whole reason why this fight happened wasn't because CM Punk told him not to use glass. Remember, real glass, cry me a river. 
We talked about this extensively. Jack Perry is not mad that at collision, Punk told him not to use glass. Perry is mad that the story got out. That is what upset Perry. Sounds like he didn't really have too much of a problem with what Punk said or told him not to do at Collision. It was the after the math. It was the belief that Punk leaked the story to the internet, and when it got out, why else would it get out? How else would something like that get out? So Punk, or Perry, assumed Punk was the one that leaked it, and he probably was, and so he made that comment on TV. Not the best idea either. Again, big show, kickoff show, pre-show you know, about to be the biggest show in your company's history, and you're going to look into the camera and create a distraction? You know, again, Punk and Perry both should have thought better. If Perry was so pissed that that story got out, talk to Punk behind the scenes. If Punk is so pissed that Perry said, real glass, cry me a river, then you wait until a different time. A locker room leader should be able to have that self-control. A locker room leader should be able to understand that now might be the best time. Even if you feel completely wronged, you know, and you were completely right about this, and Jack Perry deserves to have a foot stuck up his ass. Even if that's true, you don't do it, number one, in front of your boss, in front of the gorilla position, right before the first match on the biggest card you've ever promoted happens. That, all to me, are fireable offenses. Hey, happy accident. Backfired in the best way, because now CM Punk is back in WWE, and I love him there. I didn't think it was going to work out in AEW anyway. He seemed miserable. They seemed miserable with him. It just didn't feel right. When he came back in 2021, every was, everything was great for that first year. But after Double or Nothing 2022, it's just been a downhill skid ever since. And it was probably best for the parties to part ways. But at the end of the day, them deciding to air that footage on Dynamite didn't do anything to make them look better. Didn't do anything to help their company. Didn't do anything really to further this storyline, because I think you have enough there between the Bucks and FTR that you wouldn't even need this fucking footage anyway. I, d I did like that they said it was FTR's friend that caused a distraction, preventing them from their pre-match praying ritual and stuff. That's all great. I love that. I was laughing. I was laughing. But still, that's a stretch. It's a stretch to try to shoehorn this into part of the storyline when really, at the end of the day, all you're trying to do is make somebody from the other company look bad, draw attention to somebody in the other company, and then when you failed at doing that, your own audience was chanting that guy's name. That's stupid. So my stance on that has not changed. Ever since AEW, even before they aired the footage, I was like, this is going to be dumb, but let's at least wait, wait and see what, what we see. Because I wasn't thinking it was uh, security footage. I was thinking it was AEW's own cameras that were running. Because we heard that initially. There, there's cameras everywhere. So I was like, cool. We're going to see some good, clear HD footage of this fight, and instead we got this grainy fucking elevator camera shit. So uh, it's been a funny story to talk about all week. You know, we were not too aggressive about it. People are very angry and slobbering mad over this, and that's just fucking stupid. It's not the death of AEW. Uh, Eric, like I chronicled on Thursday, Eric Bischoff, Vince McMahon, Paul Heyman, all of them. WWE had some big ones. They had some huge desperation moments when WCW was kicking their ass. Billionaire Ted, fake Razor and fake Diesel. What if Tony Khan brought out a fake Cody and a fake Punk? Maybe then come talk to me about promoters that are mentally weak and shit because I've never seen Cody, a fake Cody or fake Punk in AEW. The Brett Screw Brett interview that Vince McMahon so horribly misread you know, and turned out to backfire. And luckily for WWE, they were smart enough to run with it. And that's what I think we might be seeing from AEW here is they got to be smart enough to run with this because what this could do is make Jack Perry a star. That's the best case scenario here. Jack Perry shows up at Dynasty, helps the Bucks beat FTR, joins the Elite, and now it's Jack Perry and the Elite and, you got, and, and the Bucks and you got Okada and try to make Jack Perry, you know, into that heal you know you want to be careful you don't want like x Pac or go away heat but you want good heat and vince mcmahon had really really good heat when he was that villain he also had the best baby face of all time to work against so jack perry isn't in as good a situation as vince was in 97 and plus i'm not sure as a fan if i trust aew to harness an opportunity that they may or may not have here i mean the biggest talk surrounding their company is surrounding, you know, an ugly incident that took place eight months ago. You do have one of those stars, you know, in your company. He's been in New Japan kind of playing off that. 
You know, now you're showing the footage, you bring them back in to kind of form up with the elite. And like I said, I, I think it would be awesome if Jack Perry used cult of personality as his theme. I don't, I don't know what the rules are with that. I don't know if Living Color can say, no, we don't want that. Or if you have to ask permission to license music or if you can just license music. I don't know the rules there, uh, but that would be kind of funny if he did that. And maybe try to make a star, try to make a, just an ultimate heel out of him if you can. You know, Christian was doing great, you know, with his, you know, with the things he's been doing as a heel and stuff. Maybe you can find something similar for Jack Perry or, you know, it's hard to compare him to Vince McMahon because Vince was a, you know, 50-something promoter. Jack Perry is an early 30s wrestler, late 20s wrestler, however old he is. Completely different situations, but, you know, you could have a similar happy accident backfire come out of that if all goes perfectly but i doubt that's going to be the case but we'll keep our eye on it dynamite airing the or footage of all in or AEW airing the all in footage on dynamite uh idiotic move looking back a couple days later now in retrospect still an idiotic move they did do a ratings increase but not a big one they drew 819k now 819,000 is a rating they could have drawn without this fucking footage that's what i expect them to draw anyway uh, so I'm not too worried about the the ratings, the declining ratings. Sure, they're low, but they're like always top two or three on cable every night. It's not going to affect them there, you know, and uh, people still consume wrestling all different which ways. A hell of a lot more than 800,000 people saw that punk footage. You know what I mean? It was all over social media, all over YouTube, all over everywhere. Even if you didn't watch Dynamite and you're a wrestling fan, you saw it. So it got a lot of buzz and whatnot. But, you know, at the end of the day it didn't really do anything to increase your television rating. It increased it a little bit, but not by much. You know, if they would have drawn over a million viewers or something, okay, then maybe. But, you know, again, that it, it would have been lose-lose for them either way. Imagine if they would have drawn over a million viewers. Here's what the haters would have said. Oh, it took a guy from another company to draw that. But then if they draw under that, or if they don't do any sort of increase, well, they did all that and they didn't even increase. See, So it, it's going to be hate from them regardless of what the result was. It does not matter. Their minds are made up. But it didn't do anything. It didn't do anything to the ratings. They didn't even pop a rating off of it. All they did was get themselves back to their normal average number. And to me, that's not really a win. So to me, it was, you know, looking back is just kind of a mistake. But I think, you know, hopefully after Dynasty, we'll have that, that new elite kind of formed. And not that the CM Punk stuff is always going to be a part of that because the Jack, whatever character we see now out of Jack Perry is going to be birthed out of that you know, situation. So we're always going to have that reminder, but hopefully, you know, after dynasty and after the elite starts forming together, then that can start being more compelling TV. You know, you know, you got to remember, got to, uh, remember, uh, Kenny Omega as well, where he might fit into that. Cause I'm sure he will be working with these guys upon his return. So hopefully all this will turn into good, a good compelling story. But at the end of the day, I'm not holding my breath. You know what I mean? Uh, also, Kenny Omega did break his silence. I guess this was today. This was floating around the internet today. Uh, he was doing, I guess, a Twitch stream or something, uh, playing video games with somebody. And people in the chat were asking him about Brawl Out. So I guess, I don't know, I guess Kenny Omega might not have an NDA for the Brawl Out because he talked a lot about it and basically just kind of broke his silence on the whole thing. Now, one of the things he did say was something that we alluded to on Thursday. And I said, you know, I during the whole fiasco with CM Punk leaving AEW, I never really heard him personally trash Kenny Omega. You know, didn't really ever feel like Punk's issue was really with him. Even during the scrum, the muffin scrum, when he's talking about working with immature kids who can't manage targets, I think he means the Bucks and Hangman. I don't even really think he meant Kenny Omega. And we did hear the story about how Kenny was trying to get the dog to safety and whatnot. And he pretty much uh, was able to corroborate that story. And in about a four minute clip, he uh, he said that uh, he had a difference of opinion with the others involved on how to handle the situation. And he went to the room there with the sole purpose of trying to defuse the situation and create a peaceful environment for everybody, which he wasn't able to do. And then when the fight broke out, he said his number one goal was to keep Larry safe and to get Larry to safety. And that's why Kenny Omega is one of the best people in the business. He views, you know, animals and pets as humans, as do I. You know, I still miss Bub every day. Tito is somewhere near me. I talk to them. I have full fucking conversations with them. I love my pets too. And I appreciate that from Kenny Omega that he was just trying to keep little Larry safe. Larry is Punk's dog, but Larry's innocent in this. 
You can't help who his owner is or anything. So the fact that uh, Kenny rushed to Larry's safety was very cool. I don't know how the fuck he wound up getting bit in all of this. Uh, but he did say, you know, being in some, being someone who is uh, involved in, in contact sports and how he knows that tempers can flare, there are there are certain situations where fights are necessary to squash a beef. And he doesn't really have any problem with fights, provided that everything's squashed after the fact. Hey, if you got to fight something out and then you shake hands and hug and, and it's squashed after the fact, then sometimes that's what you have to do in this business. So that's understandable. Uh, but that didn't seem to be the case here in, in this situation. And he also mentioned that he hasn't had executive vice president power in four years. So he's kind of, you know, removed from that situation. And it did sound like, you know, he headed down to CM Punk's locker room that night to try to be peacemaker in that. Sounds like the Bucks wanted to fight for some reason. And Kenny was like, let's see if we can talk about it. And then of course, Punk, we know the hothead he is. Those personalities clashed. Omega dove in there to try to get the dog out, wound up getting bit for some reason. Uh, and I don't even know why a steel thought he would need to bite Kenny Omega. I don't even, I mean, I guess when everybody's, you know, in there trying to pull apart, you know, you don't know who's fighting and who's not. So, you know, you might just react on somebody, but still, you know, Omega doing heroes work there, you know, getting the dog out of Dodge. I liked to hear that. And that's really the only, that's the only eyewitness account we have gotten so far from Brawl Out. It's the only one. And other people were like nearby in the room and stuff, but they haven't really talked and we don't know who was there. I'd love to get video of that. Oh my God. Got any security camera footage of Brawl Out? Let's get that and dissect that. And apparently if you were putting up the uh, the footage from All In, AEW was like taking it down. They removed it from the YouTube video. They showed the clip of the Bucks talking and, and then they said, okay, here's the clip. And then they just cut right back to the Bucks. So they even removed it out of the YouTube video. So uh, I guess they... I don't know if it was either an instant regret or they just wanted to make their point and they didn't they don't want fans taking it and then dissecting it a million different ways on YouTube. But fuck, you're the ones who released it. You're the ones who let it out. So fans are going to grab it and start doing shit with it. Sorry, you shouldn't have fucking let it out then. So I don't know what copywriting people were going to do. I was never going to play it on my channel anyway. But, you know, at the same time, I don't know. I don't know what that solves. Once it's out there, it's out there. You can copyright take it down all you want. The file exists and the file is spreading. I could go online and grab the file and save it to my own computer and watch it every day if I wanted to. It ain't going away. So copyright striking people is fucking dumb, uh, but they're the ones who released it. So, and it is their footage. They have every right to do that. I mean, at least I think it's their footage. If it's security camera footage, who owns the security camera footage? If you hold an event in an arena, the arena has security footage. Does the footage go directly to the person renting your building or does the building technically own the footage and who actually does own the copyright content on it? You know, if it's just security footage. So I don't even know how all that shit works either, uh, but they they played it and it was what it was. So there's just a little follow up for you on the whole all in footage fiasco this week that's garnered so much attention boy i'll tell you what for a company uh that's so small and is a mud show a whole lot of people are talking about it this week but then again there i'm not a, a believer in any publicity is good publicity no <laughs> i do not believe that at all and i do think that the publicity that aew did get this week wasn't the best kind you know so anyway there you go We've got a couple of WWE releases. There might be more ongoing because these happened today as I was prepping for my podcast. So I have not looked at uh, any wrestling news in about an hour and a half. So I don't know if we have any more news here or more releases, but WWE did release, and this is a sad one, Sue Aitchison. She was the director of community operations for WWE since 1986, since I was nine. It's fucking crazy, man. Uh, she is the one that's credited for leading WWE's uh, community outreach programs and was responsible for building the company's uh, uh, relationship with Make-A-Wish. And she was um, given the uh, Warrior Award in 2019, <laughs> 25 years ago, the first year, the year Brett got taken out or attacked at the Hall of Fame. Uh, they gave her the Warrior Award, and now she is let go. I'm hoping that was kind of a mutual thing. You know, 1986, she's been there a long time. Maybe this is, you know, her. she's retiring or they're letting her go or whatever. I don't know, but they are cutting loose uh, Sue Atchison, which uh, is a bummer. Also, Sid Scala, released by WWE, former, former uh, UK uh, assistant general manager. I think he was on TV a couple of times. I didn't know much about him. So those are two WWE releases that were announced today, and we will check out if there were 
any more that we have to uh, get into. Just giving my uh, chat a refresh here. We're going to get to more of these, uh, these uh, super chats in a minute. One's making me laugh. Uh, another piece of news that I found interesting. This is via P- PW Insider today. Uh, this is uh, due to this is re- uh, regarding some uh, production changes from WWE, and uh, sounds like WWE is going to be pulling back from the uh, I guess the the augmented reality content that they use every week on TV, and those are going to be those big I think I always call them like big 3D renders, whatever they are, the big shit they put on the screen during entrances and whatnot. Um, and apparently they're going to be doing a little bit less of that on TV. And they say that the plan is for that content to remain on occasion, likely pay-per-view events, but will not be much of a hallmark on WWE weekly programming. And I think that's great because I always thought that shit was just technology gone berserk. And it's just going to get crazier. People are we already walking around with those goggles fucking swiping at the air and shit. So, you know, the things that we can do technology and production wise are getting really, really mind blowing. And sometimes I thought WWE just overdid it. They wanted to play with their new toys, you know, and every time they got some new thing or, you know, they wanted to do it. And I'm like, something, we don't need all this shit. And plus a lot of those, those augmented reality, uh, you know, uh, figures and, and whatnot that we see on the screen, they do look quite badass. So if you were to save those for only pay-per-views, that's where you, that's how you do it. Keep the TVs, TVs, You know, because, you know, I've always had a problem, too, with TVs and pay-per-views don't really look anything different either. You know, they all look the same. So these new initiatives that uh, the TKO is doing, I'm loving. We've all been uh, giving high praise to WWE's uh, production and camera work lately. You know, some of the different things that we've noticed in these long, you know, kind of steady cam shot transitions, you know, from brawls into the arena. A little bit less shaky cam stuff, new, uh, new championship entrances for title matches. Just different camera angles. Haven't seen anybody standing sideways looking at the monitor in a while, although that's probably happened recently, but nothing I can think of off the top of my head. So little things like that have been really a really welcome to change by us fans. So this new one, getting rid of a lot of all that dumb shit, it would be perfect for me for TV. I'd get rid of those uh, LED ring posts and all that stuff too. You don't need all of that. You can have some flashiness. Give us pyro. Give us a well-lit arena. Give us some lasers if you must. I'm fine with all of that stuff. Entrances and whatnot, no big deal. But sometimes it was just getting like a little bit ridiculous, obnoxious, if you will. Like sometimes the shit was coming out of the screen at you, you know? So I don't need big time Bex and her wavy hair coming through and getting me in the face and shit. So save that stuff for pay-per-view because those are really cool looking effects that you do. And if you just normalize them on every show, they don't look as special. And you're probably spending an ass load of money on that type of shit for those capabilities. So keep them special, you know, because the first time I did see them, I'm like, damn, is that thing really hanging in the arena? And then I realized it was just a, you know, a digital thing. So I love this. I love this news. I love this. This to me are really big changes or changes that really show you and illustrate how bad Vince McMahon sucked. And Kevin Dunn and their philosophy and their mentality towards, you know, the production of their product and, you know, how how nice it can feel when things look different. I mean, every single thing that they do, you know, every camera angle is at the exact same position for every situation. And it's incredibly formulaic. And it always was. And now it's starting to feel less formulaic to where now I don't I can like I could just close my eyes and just book a raw in my head. You know, segment, match, commercial, fucking promo, backstage thing. You know, it's just like, God damn. So now it just feels a little bit more uh, spontaneous sometimes. You know, like what they did, was it last week with uh, Rhea Ripley just having a conversation with Dom and then he walks in and a chair flies in from off camera and just whacks her in the head. And then there's a brawl and they transition into the arena. Shit like that was never anything close to what Vince or Kevin Dunn did when they were in charge. And those were just little tiny things that greatly improve, you know, the the production and the consumption uh, of the product by your audience who has who watch who has been watching you every week for one, two, three, sometimes four decades and gotta change it up. So that's great, great, great news. Love that story coming out of uh, PW Insider today. Uh, A couple of hours ago, um, one of our favorite people in the entire wrestling business, Big E, posted an update on Twitter. And I quote, Hey, y'all. 
Two year next scans are in. Things are unchanged. My C1 has healed fibrously, but has not formed new bone. I'm not medically cleared, and truthfully, I may never be cleared. But I am blessed to be free of pain, immensely happy, and otherwise healthy. Life is good. Well, there you go. That final two sentences is all I needed to read. I am blessed to be free of pain, immensely happy, and otherwise healthy. Life is good. That's all that matters to me. That's all that matters to me. If I ever suffer any sort of life-changing injury, I mean, I hope I handle it a tenth of as good as Biggie has handled this. I mean, this is a guy who was injured and broke his neck in the prime of his career while he's a, you know, uh, you know, a world title contender, former world champion, still lots of years left, one of the most charismatic personalities we've ever had the pleasure of watching, and his career was cut right off. Did he fall into a, you know, a hole of depression? Did he fly off the rails? Did he become a recluse? Did he fall victim to addiction? No. Stayed positive, accepted what life gave him without complaint, and remained positive and happy through all of it. And that's just incredible. That's just incredible, uh, you know, just mental strength, you know, to be able to, to, to take something that's got to be very, very disappointing. And I'm not saying Biggie is just walking around happy. I'm sure there's a big part of him that's devastated that his in-ring career is likely over or could be over, you know, but reminding himself of what he does have good in life, that he is happy, you know, that he's got a roof over his head. He's, you know, financially stable. He is uh, pain-free. That's another big one. And uh, healthy. And he has his health. At least he's got that. He still loves doing appearances for WWE. WWE's never just going to cast him aside. He's probably always going to be welcomed into the family in a role of some kind. Uh, he's too... He's too charismatic and good to just not do anything. So if there's any wrestler that I think could transition out of the ring into another role, it's Big E. We've seen people like Jason Jordan taking behind the scenes roles and stuff. But, you know, Big E, maybe one day he can be somebody that's a color commentator or a backstage personality if he wants to do it. If it's something that is, you know, he desires, that would be great. But uh, it's heartbreaking to hear and to read that he may never be cleared, uh, but to just see him in general, despite all of that happy, pain-free, and healthy shit, at the end of the day, that's all that really matters. So at this point, getting B Biggie back in the ring would be a happy bonus, you know, just be a little extra. Oh, that's that's awesome, you know. Uh, otherwise, I am at peace knowing that he's at peace. And uh, all the best to Biggie, man. Such such a shame. But was nice to read that update from him today. Uh, we should talk a little bit about uh, Windy City Riot. Uh, I didn't watch it, but I've got some results, and we did see some interesting things go down on that show. Let me knock out this super chat real quack for, quack, quick from Off Leather Wings. Thank you for the five bucks, dude. TikTok got a new trend. Hashtag, we done with the Attitude Era. Young fans are tired of hearing everyone praise the Attitude Era as the greatest thing ever. I am really sorry that young fans are tired of that. I really don't give a shit what young fans are tired of, to be honest with you. Uh, those young fans missed out, man. I was in my 20s during the Attitude Era. I was the best age to be a wrestling fan. Uh, between the ages of, uh, of uh, 1990 and 2000, I was 13 to 23. That's a great great age to be. I was 21 in 1998. I was drinking my first beer with, well, not my first beer, but my first beer legally with Stone Cold Steve Austin. And uh, I got to live the Attitude Era at the best age you could possibly live the Attitude Era in. I was, I was already out of school. I was long since graduated high school. I never, I never wore a DX or Austin shirt to school. I was already out of school and a full-blown adult having a good time, watch the Attitude Era. It was a blast. I went to a lot of shows. I traveled. I met wrestlers. I got in car accidents with wrestlers. I did everything in the Attitude Era. Lived it, breathed it, loved it. When I look back at the content, a lot of that shit doesn't age well, but it wasn't necessarily about judging the content side by side with the content now. It's about how you lived it, how you experienced it. And those young fans that are mad never experienced it, so they're never going to understand so, therefore, I don't give a fuck what their TikTok trends are. Fuck you, young people. I'm kidding. But that's a funny trend. All right. All right. That knocks it out for the supers for now. Good to see uh, Antoine in here. Uh, it was a high school fight. It wasn't that serious. So it wasn't. It was, it, it was a high school fight. That's all it was. But still, when you lunge at somebody, when you start a fight and then lunge at your boss, 
right before you're about to go out there on the company's biggest show. I'm sorry, that's a fireable offense. The fight was not much. It was just a, a maybe a punch or a shove that you couldn't even tell if Punk landed. You could barely even find the choke in there, although it was there. People were pulled apart. No one was injured. So yeah, it was uh, it was less than it wasn't even a it was a uh, a lot less bad than a high school fight. I remember some high school fights. I saw some gnarly ones. We had a kid got thrown right through the glass window in the library, straight through it. Fucking Shane McMahon threw the King of the Ring thing like that, you know. And it was the whole fucking deal and stuff, fucking blood everywhere and shit. So uh, I was in a gnarly school. So I think uh, even for high school, this was pretty tame. Uh, and that's, you know, what a lot of people are pointing out, that the fight, you know, wasn't much. When you look at all of the backstage scuffles that have taken place in wrestling history, this is the least violent one. It is. It's the least violent pro wrestling fight that I've ever heard of. The most violent probably goes to Dan Spivey and Adrian Adonis. The least violent goes to uh, Punk and Jack Perry. Brett and Sean might be in the least violent category, so that just since that just involved uh, hair pulling, uh, you know, I think uh, Kali and Big Show go down as the funniest fight <laughs> as they fell over a table and rolled all on the ground. So we get fights. They're not uncommon, uh, but still can't be fighting. All right, so last night, New Japan was in Chicago for Windy City Riot. On this show, you saw John Moxley become the new IWGP World Heavyweight Champion, defeating Tetsuya Naito in the main event. Posed with the trophy with Renee backstage. Fucking great. Love that. You talk about a guy who has arguably had the best career outside of WWE since leaving there. He is now IWGP World Champion. He's already been um, IWGP US Champion, correct, uh, as well in the past. Held that title for a while because I think he held it during COVID and couldn't drop it <laughs> or whatever. So he's done business over there before. Now that he's the new world champion is great. That's great for New Japan. He's a great world champion to have because this is a guy now. Shit. Is he the first guy? Is he the first guy to hold the IWGP, the AEW, and the WWE? I think he is. And he is. We haven't had many uh, AEW champions, <laughs> so he's got to be. So that's fucking great for him. Love that. Also, Zack Sabre Jr. defeated uh, Riddle uh, on uh, in that show last night to win the uh, New Japan TV title. So he's your new TV champion. Cut a really fun promo after the match. I saw a little bit of that on social media. That was good uh, and happy that uh, Zack Sabre Jr. won that title back. Uh, also, Mustafa Ali had a match in Chicago last night, defeating uh, Hiromu Takahashi. Watched a little bit of his post-match promo as well. And uh, Nick Nemeth, a.k.a. Dolph Ziggler, uh, defeated Tomohiro Ishii. So we had some interesting matchups last night with those four specifically. Uh, Moxley, Naito, uh, Zack, and Riddle, uh, Ali, and Takahashi, and Nemeth, and Ishii. But also we had Jack Perry, who lost to Shota Umino. And when Jack Perry came out, he had the Chicago flag with the stars and shit. And then he had a jacket on the back of the jacket. It said, cry me a river. It was like painted on kind of reminiscent of Vince's NWO on the back of the chair. So he basically had that going on with the cry me a river. He lost to Umino though. And after the match, uh, he still shook his hand and hugged him. So he was a baby face kind of at the end of the match. Uh, incidentally in the match, I do believe he hit a GTS, uh, during the match as well. Uh, so after the match, there was a pick backstage with him and Kenta, both giving the finger to Chicago, which was kind of funny. And uh, despite the loss, I still think Jack, you know, that might be his his loss on his way out because I'm really hoping Perry shows up at Dynasty and helps the Bucks win. Otherwise, what the fuck is all this for? So, you know, he's going to eat a couple of L's here, maybe on his way back to AEW. And, uh, and join up uh, with uh, the elite, hopefully, at D Dynasty. We will see. But pretty eventful show coming out of Chicago last night uh, for New Japan, crowning a couple of new champions. And that's all kinds of fun. Uh, looked like Renee Paquette was there. Tony Khan I saw backstage and some of the pictures and shit floating around. So uh, Forbidden Door this year should be good, man. There's a whole bunch of good possibilities uh, on tap for that. And uh, I can't wait. Uh, speaking or keeping on the subject of... AEW, we might as well just stick with that real quick uh, because we just talked about New Japan and then we will circle back and we'll talk about uh, SmackDown and what that could mean uh, for 
or I'm sorry, what happened on SmackDown, Cody's backlash plans, the bloodline, all of that. We'll talk about that in one second. But this past week's Dynamite, we've already really dissected the footage. We've talked about the Bucks promo where they aired the footage and then said why they aired it. And, you know, basically they're using it, you know, as a tool in the build with their match at FTR at Dynasty. Well, after they did that whole segment, FTR did storm to the ring and cut a very good promo. I really like the promo they cut. Cash and Dax, passionate, was great. But again, you know, it's all part of this drawing attention to CM Punk. And even though the promo was good, the promo could have been good anyway without this stuff, you know, because, you know, Dax is a passionate guy and the Bucks and FTR have a lot of history. So I, again, I just questioned, you know, the necessity of all this, basically. So uh, FTR did cut a good promo and the match is going to be somewhat intriguing, but, you know, maybe not intriguing enough to warrant showing that footage. So I stand, I stand by my my opinions there. Um, we had a this. I'm going to be all over the place because these results are not in order. But I did want to mention the Cope Open. Uh, Adam Copeland was out there to defend his TNT title. Penta answered the call. That was cool. This is what I love about Copeland. I love about Edge that he's there just working with. It's almost like he's kind of hand selecting people. When he came back to WWE, it felt like he wanted to do that. Remember when he made that appearance in NXT and he was standing there? I don't even know who was in the ring with him. Maybe it was Balor. And somebody else, but he's just pointing at guys. Like, I really feel like he wanted to come in and say, I want to work with him. I want to work with him. I want to work with him. You know, and but he was just a little bit more maybe uh, handcuffed by WWE. Okay, slow down there, Adam. <laughs> we got we got our own plans for you. Uh, but maybe in AEW, Tony Khan's like, look, thank you for being here. Work with whoever the fuck you want. <laughs> so Adam is probably like, okay, I want to work with him and then him and then him. Copeland might even already have his uh, hand-selected opponent who he wants to drop the belt to eventually. But just seeing... Edge and Penta having a one-on-one -on -one match for a championship. Tell yourself a year ago, see, that was going to be on your bingo card. It wouldn't have been. And this match got so fun because I guess backstage they had something with Stokely mentioned uh, to ask Willow to go challenge for the TNT title or something, which is kind of funny. But after Edge defeats Penta, the lights go out and he's then attacked by Brody King. Brody King attacks uh, Adam Copeland. Julia Hart is with him. And then as the two of them are like beating down Edge, Willow <laughs> makes the save. It's just a funny visual to watch this gigantic man beating the hell out of Adam Copeland. And here comes Willow to make the save. But she was really coming out uh, to target uh, Julia Hart. They, of course, do have a TBS title match on Dynasty, which Willow is going to win and then drop it to Mercedes at double or nothing. It's almost too obvious that they're doing that. So I'm almost hoping they change something up there because that's a little bit too obvious. And speaking of Mercedes, she had a sit down interview with Alex Marvez, which was boring as all hell. Uh, and she did reveal though, uh, on Twitter, I think, uh, earlier in the day that her first match, according to her will be at double or nothing. So that's a long time to wait there. I think it'll be a calendar year since she wrestled by the time double or nothing gets here. And if that match or if her first match is going to be for a TBS title shot or for the TBS championship, because she referenced in her interview with uh, Marvez that she's been in the ring with Willow before and she lost to Willow and lost the title to Willow. So they're setting all that up. And I don't know if that's too long or not. The lights then went out and she got attacked and laid out. So we don't really know who attacked her. I saw somebody mention maybe turn Mercedes heel. I'd kind of be into that. Um, I like Mercedes a lot. I think if she can just get cooking, I think she's going to be great. I think she's a great professional wrestler, but I'm not, I'm not a huge fan of just the vibe, you know, of her sometimes, you know, just, you know, the way she delivers her promos or whatever, just not super compelling to a fan like me. You don't care a ton, but she's had a good enough track record and she's had some phenomenal matches in her career where I'm always going to, always going to have respect for Sasha or Mercedes, but so far, nothing in AEW is really hitting for me yet. That doesn't mean it can't change. That doesn't mean once she gets in the ring and starts moving, starts getting into a program, getting into a rhythm, that's where you're going to find your success. You know, these interviews and these promos just, you know, taking forever to get to your first pay-per-view match. I mean, how much, what are you going to say in these things? You know, we're going to have what, six more fucking weeks of this until we get to, to double or nothing. Okay, I think you'd be better served at this point to maybe turn her heel because I think the fans might just get a little bit tired of that. You know, or if Mercedes, you know, believes that she's a big enough star where she'd she should have to make the fans wait to see her in the ring. You know, but as good as she is in the ring, she's not offering me a work rate 
that would make me feel, oh, it's going to be worth the wait. Don't worry, guys. It's okay if it takes four months for Mercedes to get in the ring. Once you get in the ring, it's all going to be worth it. I don't feel that way about her. Sorry. You know, so I want her run there to be a success. I want her presence in the women's division to help the women's division. I want her to win championships there, have championship feuds, see success, and help grow the division. You know, and that's what I want her to do so far. It's been nothing but talking. I'm not an impatient fan. I have no problem. I don't need to see her just fucking in the ring on week one. You know, WWE's taking their time too with Jade Cargill. Uh, and a lot of fans are matches are too short. I'm like, yeah, I think that's the point. <laughs> so, uh, you know, they're taking their time. And for whatever their reasons are, Mercedes, you know, you know, still on the comeback trail and whatnot from her injury and whatever she's got to work out. But I think if you wait until double or nothing, and that's her first match, and she wins a championship, that's heelish to me. <laughs> so I don't know. We'll we'll see what happens there. I can't wait to see Mercedes and Tony Storm start getting into it. That's going to be a lot of fun. Speaking of Tony Storm, they had she's taking on Thunder Rosa at the pay-per-view, which is going to be great. I'm excited for that match. And they were doing some sh uh, champagne toast segment on Dynamite where she was going to have Thunder Rosa come out. Luther was there. Renee Paquette is uh, moderating this thing. And they've got the split screen again with half black and white on Tony and then color for Thunder Rosa. And watching Luther pour the champagne, I'm such a champagne snob because I, I work in restaurants and I'm around nice, you know, champagne and wine and stuff like that. And whenever I see champagne in wrestling, I always get so mad. This was not real champagne. It was just fucking water or uh, sparkling water at best because when Luther is pouring it, he's pouring it so hard into the glass. If that was real champagne, it would bubble and explode everywhere. So it's either super flat champagne that they opened at 10 o'clock in the morning and sat out all day, or it's just sparkling water. And it made me think of Carmella. I always got so mad at Carmella on WWE when she was doing those champagne toasts in the ring. What was she doing with the champagne? She, maybe that was when she was champion or whenever she was just thinking she, she was Mella's money or whatever the fuck. And she's in there with the champagne and it was Corbell. They even showed the label Corbell's fucking 12 bucks at your local Piggly Wiggly. You know, I'm like, that's not nice champagne. Get some uh, Vouve Clicquot or some Perrier Jouet or some uh, Cristal or anything that just costs some money. Fucking Corbell. I wouldn't, I wouldn't piss in a Corbell bottle. You know, so I just laugh at that. So last night they were using fake champagne. I can see you, you fakers, AEW and WWE, either using shitty champagne or fake champagne. Ugh. <laughs> but uh, they didn't even get a chance to do anything. Renee asked for a glass of champagne. That's what made, made me notice all this because she asked for some. And then Luther's like, here, and he just pours it so hard. I'm like, that would be bubbling all over if that was real. Um, before anybody can either, even take a sip, uh, I think Renee did get a sip in. Tony Dex uh, Thunder Rosa knocks her out. Deanna Perrazzo comes out to help out and try to help up Thunder Rosa. And then she shakes her off. And then Perrazzo's like, fuck you then. And storms off, which I kind of liked, you know, because that happens a lot in wrestling. You you know, two tag team partners bump into each other or something and they, you know, kind of get mad. It's a misunderstanding. But at least Perrazzo was like, fuck you then. I came out to help you, you bitch. And then just left. Loved that. So even though that segment was short, it made me chuckle. Uh, we should talk about Will Ospreay as well. You know, Will Ospreay did that uh, interview on the stage with Renee Paquette that I thought was really good. Uh, the second half of it was tremendous because it was all about Danielson and his match there. And I love, I've been saying this lately, I absolutely love hearing Will Ospreay speak. I love his tone, his cadence, his accent, all of that stuff. He just comes off like a star. He's entertaining as all hell on the mic. And... My only issue with this, maybe, uh, was the timing of this. I think for Osprey to clap back at Triple H, the comments that Triple H made, he was well within his rights to do that because I think Triple H was an asshole, what he said. But you have to, you have to question the timing and the place here. Uh, this happened after, right? Wasn't this after the CM Punk stuff? So right after you do all of that, you're now going to be drawing... Yet more attention to WWE again. And, you know, there I've talked about this before. There is a line. You know, the fans that are tribal are just going to say, you shouldn't mention the other competition just because they need it to fit in whatever side they're on. I'm okay with back and forth shots. I like back and forth shots. I want them. I welcome them. You know, but, and I have no problem with the companies acknowledging the other's existence 
from time to time. It's fun for fans. For fans who aren't tribal and have got their heads all the way up their own asses and up into their own ribs, it's really fun when that stuff happens. But like I said, there's a limit to it, and you can't do that too much. And I think one of the biggest issues I had in back in the day when I first started this channel with TNA is too much of that. Taking the cookies to SmackDown and stuff. I'm like, what are you guys doing? You look like idiots. This is why you're garbage, is because of shit like this. Because you got a whole bunch of talent there. And you've got a fan base. You've got talent and you've got a fan base there, desperate, thirsty for something else other than WWE. And here you are, just like Paul Heyman or ECW back in the day, just hanging on every word, reacting to everything they do. One, one of those Highlanders showed up, remember, and in the crowd and they showed them on camera and shit. Like, get, get over yourselves, you know, focus on yourself. And you have an audience base there that wants you because you're different. And you're doing nothing but alienating those audience members now. Starting to get that feeling sometimes with AEW a little bit. And even though I love Will Ospreay, he's one of my favorites, if not my favorite in the game right now, at least in AEW he is, uh, you, you have to question on maybe the timing here because this happened right after the punk stuff. Now you're doing it again. And you have to remember, and, and first of all, what Osprey said was great, you know, because Triple H in that interview mentioned something about, you know, somebody doesn't want the grind. I don't want them anyway. And Osprey clapped back. Well, you were grinding on the boss's door and all that. That was great. I liked that. And that was a shot sent back to Triple H that was definitely deserved. But think about where Triple H made his comment compared to where Will Osprey made his. Triple H was doing an ass load of media podcast interviews was it was uh was the osprey stuff on pat mcafee i forgot where it was but bottom line is wrestlemania week and weekend if you are in wwe you are going to be doing nothing but media constant back-to-back -back, one after another interviews and you're going to be talking about everything there are a lot of people who probably did not even hear triple h say that we heard it because we're all freaks and we all love pro wrestling but there are probably some who weren't even aware that Triple H made that comment. So, you know, if that's... Sorry, I'm trying to get my... Uh, so if you're watching this at home, what... And you never saw Triple H's uh, interview, and you never heard what Triple H said, you could be saying to yourself, what the hell is he talking about? <laughs> I don't even know what he's talking about. What the hell is Osprey even saying here? But that was his response to Triple H's comment, which, I, again, he had every right to make. But, you know, Triple H kind of said it just in an interview or a podcast. And then Osprey decides to respond on national cable TV. I don't know. Maybe Osprey should have waited until he was interviewed by a podcast or something to send that shot back. Might have been better. I'll admit that. But the line was still good. Uh I do not believe this narrative that Renee was all embarrassed. No, she wasn't. Renee is married to John Moxley. Renee knows full well all of the problems and frustrations that one can have with WWE. She was treated horribly by, by Vince McMahon. Remember the whole lineal champion thing? Just look that up. I don't think she gives a shit, you know? And so with Triple H, I'm sh she has a great relationship with him. She has a great relationship with Stephanie, but she's just the interviewer. It has nothing to do with her. She's the girl with the stick, man. You know, so she kind of made that face like, mm, you know, uh, I don't think that she was uncomfortable or embarrassed at all. I do think Tony Schiavone was, though. Tony Schiavone, you could see it written all over his face. You know why? Because he was in WCW at the end. And he remembers some some moments of desperation that that company had. And there's a lot of uh, there was a lot of uh, AEW is WCW 2000 comparisons going on this week as well, which it's not that bad. Uh, we are not at, at WCW 2000 levels yet. <laughs> Let's hope we don't get there. But no, I think that's an exaggeration. Not quite there yet. All I do. I, and, and if you want that to be proved, just go watch WCW 2000 and I rest my case. But that doesn't mean we can't get there, you know, and some things like this, maybe they should have spread these out a week. Maybe Osprey should have just had a match this week and then had a promo next week where he said this uh, or something like that. Otherwise, I don't know if this specific instance was wise in terms of where he chose to make his rebuttal to Triple H. But like I said, he has every right to make that rebuttal because of how shitty the comment was. I, I don't care what you say. That was a dick thing to say by Triple H. And it's it's frustrating and, you know, almost like offensive because of 
this shitty assumption. Triple H is somebody I want to respect. You know, you shouldn't be this mad about Osprey choosing another promotion or much less not necessarily choosing another promotion, just making a personal decision for himself and his family. You don't know this man. Who are you to assume this man's whole life? It just mean he must not be interested in the grind. It just mean he must not really, really be in this for the long haul. If he just wants to take less, more money and less and less work dates. Or it could be that he has a family and he lives in the UK and he doesn't want to uproot his family, which he would have to do if he signed with WWE. Therefore, AEW was a better fit for him and his family. You fucking asshole. You fucking asshole. Triple H was a fucking asshole for saying that. And Will Ospreay had every right to send something back. I just maybe would have done it somewhere else instead of Dynamite on the same show that you're already drawing attention to CM Punk. Because the two biggest, most talked about segments for the most part coming out of Dynamite is what they showed Punk do and what, they sh when, and what Ospreay said. And both of those was about people in the other company. That's not really what you want to be doing, in my opinion, you know, but judging it on its own, somebody says something shitty. I would probably want to retort as well. And maybe Will Ospreay is like, hey, Tony, can I say something to true? Can I clap, bark back at Triple H on, on TV tonight? Yeah, sure. You know, it might have been something like that, but maybe everybody there should have thought that maybe the timing on this maybe wasn't so good, but. <clears throat> Osprey chose to say it there, and it was what it was. Still a funny comment. Still a, a shot being fired, you know, across, you know, the promotions there, which, you know, usually does not bother me, and I usually welcome. But they are kind of pushing the limits, I think, of what was necessary on Wednesday night. Not going to lie. Uh, other than that, on Dynamite, the only thing really left to talk about, oh, uh, the Jericho hook shit is stupid. So Jericho teamed up with Hook and Shibata. They lost to uh, Taylor Promotions. And Jericho is and is arguing with Hook outside the ring at one point. Remember the learning tree. Remember the learning tree. All this shit about the learning tree, which he apparently has trademarked, along with a couple of other names like uh, the heir of Jericho or the fresh heir of Jericho or something like that. So he's got all these stupid new trademarks, which makes me think, which makes me think he isn't going anywhere. But I think the idea of Hook needing to learn under Jericho's learning tree is idiotic. Hook's dad is Taz. Uh, there's no, what there's nothing Jericho can offer to hook. It's just stupid. So they lost, by the way, and uh, kind of that uh, dissension there. They're playing into that a little bit. So we'll see if this is going to eventually just lead to another match between Jericho and Hook, or if this is maybe going to be Hook's exit. Is Jericho going to be the guy to fucking Judas affect Hook right out of the the company? Because apparently he's going to test free agency when his contract is up this year. Do not know when Hook's contract is up. All we know is it's up this year, according to reports. I don't know who originally reported this, so I can't credit them. I'm sorry. Um, but if that's the case, you know, WWE, I could definitely believe has an interest in Hook. And if Hook went to WWE, I think AEW could say the goodbye to Taz. I think if Hook were to sign with WWE, Taz would leave when his contract is up. I do. I would love to have Taz replace Booker T in NXT. Maybe for fun, get Taz and Michael Cole back on SmackDown. I'd be fine with that. Taz coming back to WWE to, to be a, a, an announcer again in some capacity, I'd be fine with. And if his son, you know, gets signed to the company, you know, maybe Taz follows. I don't know what kind of deal Taz has or whatever, but, you know, a lot of these family members, you know, you have to wonder about them. You know, father and son are going to really be working in, in different companies, but you got Dustin and Cody in separate companies. You got Rick and Charlotte in different companies. So it's not out of the question. It just makes you wonder. So we'll see if uh, Tony Khan, uh, you know, throws a bunch of money at Hook to keep him around or if Hook maybe wants to get his butt into that performance center and really maybe really develop himself into a world-class athlete. We'll have to see. Uh, the main event on Dynamite was Samoa Joe defeating Dustin Rhodes in a world title eliminator match. They tried to open the show with this, but Joe was attacked by Swerve, uh, speared through a table and whatnot. They didn't know if the match was going to happen, but it did. Dustin got all busted open, fought hard, bloodied, but in the end, uh, the champ put him down. That would have been crazy if they belted up Dustin. and You got Cody as WWE champ and Dustin as AEW champ. That would have been wild. 
Um, but uh, in the end, Samoa Joe wins. And after the match, he's still got the choke locked in on Dustin. And Swerve just comes flying in with a kick right to his face and just nails Joe, puts him down. And uh, Swerve got him some of Joe hard on Dynamite this week. So if I had to guess, if the plan is to belt up Swerve at Dynasty, I feel like this week on, Di on Dynamite, Joe's going to get the best of Swerve because Swerve beat him up in the beginning and then he flew in with a crazy uh, decapitating kick at the end of the Dustin match. So I feel like this week Joe is going to put down Swerve, maybe bloody him up, choke him out, something like that. Uh, and then we'll go into Dynasty uh, in uh, in a week and uh, Swerve will win the championship. That's my early prediction. Here's what we got for Collision and Battle of the Belts tonight. Collision, you will see House of Black taking on Dante Martin, Action Andretti, and Matt Seidel. We got Tony Storm versus AZM. Lee Moriarty versus uh, Shibata. Good. We get a win for Shibata because I feel like he's been jobbing a lot and he should win this one tonight. And Claudio and Danielson taking on uh, Fletcher and Hobbs. And also this week on Dynamite, I believe it's Claudio and Osprey, right? I think. I'm pretty sure it's Claudio and Osprey, which holy shit. Get that lotion ready. Uh, also tonight, Battle of the Belts 10. We got Roddy versus Rocky. Uh, Roderick Strong and Rocky Romero uh, for the, uh, what's it called? The <laughs> international title. We got Hook taking on Shane Taylor. I guess that's an FTW match. And Athena versus Red Velvet. Ooh. Athena vs. Red Velvet. That'll be all kinds of good as well. So that's what's on tap tonight for AEW. Uh, we'll get into last night's SmackDown now uh, and wrap up with that. Before I do, I will go to the chat here and uh, see if there's any other things I need to answer. Jay Boba's got five bucks for us. What do you think of a Cody vs. Orton trilogy this summer with Orton slowly turning heel, similar to Ray and Eddie in 2005? That could work. Orton's got to do something. Cody's got to do something. Orton and Cody are now kind of both on the SmackDown brand. Uh, and that would look good. I think Cody and Orton for the title at SummerSlam? Sure. Sure. I'd be fine with that. Uh, I don't know if, you know, if, if Rock is going to come back in prior to that. Probably not. Uh, I thought, you know, maybe we could see Cody and Roman at SummerSlam, perhaps. Maybe. Uh, I don't think we're going to see Brock coming back anytime soon. We know, as we're about to talk about in a minute here, who Cody's opponent is likely going to be at Backlash. So that will not be the same opponent by the time we get to this summer. Plus, we got Money in the Bank coming up as well. And a lot of these shows are international, right? I think, uh, where's Money? Is Money in the Bank? Money in the Bank might be Toronto. So you got Backlash in France. And then you got uh, Money in the Bank in Toronto. And just SummerSlams in Cleveland. And then you got Clash of the Castle coming up in Scotland in May. So uh, lots going on. But yeah. Orton and Cody, it feels like a main event program between them needs to happen given their history. So, yeah, I'd be into that. Cody, Randy Orton, uh, you know, using his legendary status to put Cody over. I'd be all for that. Uh, Juliet's gifting out some memberships, uh, hooking up Randy Trotman. Thank you for that, Juliet. She's always just making it rain with the memberships. I appreciate that. Um, Oh, yeah, I meant, yeah, well, they, I meant like kind of family members, like brother, sister, uh, uh, or uh, daughter's husband or daughters and fathers. But yeah, there's also, we know the couples, Rhea and Buddy and Zelina and, and uh, Malachi, and up until a couple of months ago, Charlotte and Andrade. So, I mean, like immediate family members, though, uh, is what I was talking about there. So it wouldn't be that uncommon. You're right. At least WCW 2000 was entertaining. What are you watching, Ben? It wasn't entertaining to me. WCW 2000 was crap. I mean, if you want to, if you want to see a true example of pettiness, just look at the Oklahoma character. There's nothing, no, no, no security cam footage from All In, or no grinding on the boss's daughter comment will ever uh, be anywhere in the same universe of the pettiness of the Oklahoma character at all. I watched WCW 2000. I lived through it. It was trash. I much prefer what I see from AEW today than what I saw from WCW 24 years ago by a mile, by a mile. Um, all right, I think that uh, catches up some of those. Hopefully I haven't missed any Super Chats. If I am, just uh, let me know. Have you guys noticed this new YouTube layout? It's driving me nuts. I can't see my viewers or likes. There we go. 
you don't mind, if you haven't hit that uh, thumbs up button for me, I would appreciate it. I can see the chat now, but uh, they've got like, they now have the chat on the, on the right hand side where the related videos used to be. And now all the related videos are below the video, which I understand. Now you can read the chat and see the video at the same time, but I don't know. It was just, I just don't like it. <laughs> I don't like it. It takes me forever to get used to these type of things. Anyway, let's talk about last night's WWE SmackDown, Little Caesars Arena, Detroit, Michigan, home of the Lions, or not Lions, Red Wings and, uh, and Pistons, my old stomping grounds there. And it was opened up by, of course, our new WWE champion, Cody Rhodes. Now, it does sound like, I still can't figure out if they are phasing out the universal name of the championship or not. They're still using Undisputed, which I don't like because I don't understand how it can be Undisputed when you have another championship right there. Uh, so it's not Undisputed. It's Disputed. So I, don't, I, I think at this point it would be great and make a fan like me really happy if WWE just went back to calling it the WWE Championship. Make it simple. Drop the Universal from the name. Drop the Undisputed. I have hated the Universal title's existence since the day Finn Balor forfeited it. I was willing to give the Big Red Purse a chance. I thought the SummerSlam match was good when Balor won, but then he got hurt. He forfeited it. Kevin Owens winning was also tremendous. One of my favorite matches ever when Triple H reaches out his hand and Kevin Owens looks legitimately shocked that he won the title. Those are the, That's the best moment the Universal title ever had. Otherwise, it's been largely a disappointment, and we've had some terrible... Title changes with that thing involving the Fiend that I don't even want to remember. Um, I've just hated that belt, and I've hated the name of the belt. So it would be great if Cody, if they just went back to the way it was in 2002, and he had a WWE title and a World Heavyweight title. That's it. Now there's extra names, no more Undisputed or Uncooked or whatever's or Universal. Just get it out of there and simplify and get it the fuck out of our lives already. So hopefully that's still kind of happening. Sometimes they were referring to the championship as the WWE championship. And a few times they were adding the word undisputed, but hopefully they're phasing that out. If anybody knows the story here in the chat, let me know. But Cody opened up the show and I loved that he said, who said it was open mic night, bitch? <laughs> Quoting Brandy when she confronted Jade Cargill back on Dynamite back in the day, or maybe Rampage or wherever that was. And uh, Cody's out there with the belt, looking good, still getting used to carrying that thing. He is the champ now. He's the man now. He's out there in the suit. And he announces that his challenger at Backlash will be the winner of a match between two triple threat matches. So the winners of two triple threat matches will face next week. The winner of that will face Cody. So that was pretty much the deal there. The two triple threat matches that we saw on SmackDown, we'll just talk about these right now was LA Knight defeating Bobby Lashley and Santos Escobar. So that was the first one, Knight, Lashley, Santos. And Cody runs through all of the uh, combatants here and the participants in his promo. So LA Knight won the first one. And in the second match, it was going to be AJ Styles versus Kevin Owens versus Rey Mysterio. So I'm like, okay, I feel like it's got to be AJ. Otherwise, you're going to be doing a babyface match in France. And AJ would be a great opponent, first opponent, championship opponent for Cody just because of their legacies and their histories and whatnot. And I even I think he said, he said, me and AJ are the only ones to hold the NWA and the WWE championships. I think he said that. Well, that's not totally true. He said something along those lines last night. But even when he was uh, naming the you know, participants in the matches, I was feeling like it was going to be AJ. So once LA Knight won, I'm like, ah, I got it. <laughs> He's, AJ's going to get his win back now. And I see, I see. So then in the main event, we get a great match between AJ Styles, Owens and Rey Mysterio with of course, AJ Styles winning. And the finish was a tremendous sequence. The finish sees AJ, uh, Owens is laying on the ground. AJ goes up to the second rope with Rey gets him in Styles Clash position, hits an Avalanche Styles Clash onto Rey Mysterio, or I'm sorry, hits an Avalanche Styles Clash on Rey Mysterio on Kevin Owens, which then they flip right over into the pinning combination. It was one of the smoothest transitions I've ever seen. It looks so perfect. And those are the type of 
sequences that I want a non-wrestling fan to be channel surfing and come across Fox and be like, oh, snap, that was pretty cool. You know, so I love that. AJ Styles got the win and a tremendous finish there. And now next week on SmackDown, it will be AJ Styles versus LA Knight. The winner of that will face Cody at Backlash, and it's got to be AJ Styles. That's the match I want to see. I don't really want to see Cody and LA Knight. Sorry, I don't. I want to see Cody and AJ. I think Cody and AJ will tear it up in France. Absolutely. Already looking forward to that. Because you always have to know that in most cases, other than for some reason, Triple H in 2002. I don't know what the fuck happened there. Yes, I do. Terry Bollet happened. But in most cases, if you're going to win the belt and become the champion and be crowned in the main event of WrestleMania, you're probably not going to lose the belt on the next pay-per-view. 99 out of 100 times, you're going to be safe. <coughs> so whoever your first opponent is going to be needs to be someone that's not going to beat you anyway um, and just needs to be that person that's not going to win the championship. Unfortunately, AJ is going to be in this position, but it's not a bad one to be in because I think he'll give Cody a great match. He'll beat LA Knight next week. It'll be Cody and AJ at Backlash, and that's going to be Cody's start as a world champion. He's going to work with AJ Styles first. Looking forward to that. I think that's going to be great. So at least we know what Cody's going to be doing in the immediate future. Um, I guess before we get to the bloodline stuff, let's talk about a couple of other things. Bailey had a promo last night as well, kind of her victory speech with the championship, thanked the fans. She got interrupted by Tiffany because Bailey is about to offer up a championship match to somebody. Tiffany comes out there. I guess she's wearing a play on uh, one of uh, Alicia Silverstone's uh, outfits in Clueless with the checkers and the yellow or whatnot. Somebody pointed that out. I thought that was funny. And Tiffany, of course, thinks the title shot is for her, but Bailey's like, no, I had someone else in mind for that. And then Naomi comes out. Naomi, you know, tells Tiffany to fuck off. And then that leads to a one-on-one -on -one match between Naomi and Tiffany. And I guess the winner of this will get the title shot next week. And since Tiffany did already beat Naomi once, I think on TV a few weeks ago, this was Naomi's opportunity to get her win back. She put down Tiffy and does have a championship match, I guess, next week on SmackDown against her friend Bailey. So uh, Bailey will no doubt be defeating Naomi. Uh, Braun Breaker was out with some new music. I think it's uh, safe to say that we all fucking hate Def Rebel. Uh, but when he came out to this new music, I thought it was... Um, I thought it was Symphony of Destruction by Megadeth because the crowd, you, the crowd was, uh, you know, was cheering. So I couldn't hear it exactly, but it kind of at first had that dun, 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 that thing. I thought it was the same song. I'm like, no, that's not it. It's just some bullshit. Uh, but it did have high energy. A lot of fans didn't really love the theme, uh, but I thought it had enough, you know, kind of energy for Braun Breaker's character. And of course he came, you know, power walk into the ring. Made very quick work of Cameron Grimes. Cameron Grimes has been doing nothing so long. He cut it. His, he had time to cut his hair and grow it back, which is crazy because he's always been super entertaining. And once they did that gimmick with him back in the day with the GameStop stock and all that, that was so good. I thought that was going to be his his rise, you know, to popularity. But you fucking they hit the skids with him, and I got to the point where I forgot he was even there. But he was out here to. Get his ass kicked by Braun Breaker and a very Goldberg-like victory for Breaker. Also, Jade and Bianca Belair teaming up again. They defeated Piper, Niven, and Chelsea Green. Now they're wearing matching outfits. And Michael Cole mentioned that the tag team division, you know, is on notice. And I definitely think they're going to win the championships. Uh, and I guess this is a good enough start for Bianca, or I'm sorry, for Jade Cargill because you know, keeping her in a tag team, you know, just kind of starting her slowly. You know, her matches have been largely squashes. She beat uh, Chelsea Green in five seconds on Raw. So she's not in there yet to really be doing a whole lot. And if she's going to team with, with Bianca, they're going to make a pretty badass tag team uh, and tag team champions at some point. But also at some point, they're going to have to break up and perhaps feud. And that could, all, that could also be fun. Now, during this match, there was like a, another one of those screen glitches. They did one of these, I think, on Raw. We saw like a test pattern come up. And they did one of these in Bianca's match, Bianca and Jade's match as well, where you had some text on the screen that said, uh, you forgot about us. Us. 
So we've already kind of sniffed out that these little teases are likely going to be for Uncle Howdy, which is going to be played by Bo Dallas, the brother of Bray Wyatt. They alluded to that in the Bray Wyatt documentary to keep an eye out for a character like this on TV pretty soon. So all of these little teases are, most fans are assuming that that's what this is going to be for. They're probably right to assume that, although we don't know for sure. Um, but when it said, you forgot about us, and I'm like, oh, okay, well, who else was really involved? Alexa Bliss. Where's she been? We haven't seen her in a long while. Or wait, did she get pregnant? Oh, shit, she might have gotten pregnant. She might not even be coming back. What's Alexa Bliss's deal? I don't even know what her fucking deal is. But maybe that's Alexa Bliss. Maybe she's coming back to be a part of this, too. I really liked Alexa's involvement with The Fiend when she first kind of got, like, possessed by him or under his spell, and she started getting the wild hair and kind of looking at him funny. And I liked that transition. And then she came and went into full-blown, morphed into, you know, the little schoolgirl on the swing. But those early... Those early interactions, I think, were my favorite when she'd have like the wild Jericho from Nitro in 1997 hair and shit. Uh, really thought that was funny and good. So maybe Alexa is going to be a part of this. We will see. Uh, I kind of hope she is. It might be good. Some fans might be over, you know, the supernatural type of gimmicks and stuff. And this might not even be supernatural more than just, you know, maybe mind games or creepy stuff. But, you know, these type of gimmicks aren't for everybody. They have not always worked uh undertaker and, and kane of course were tremendous you know the fiend had his moments and uh, all that went wrong with the fiend felt like it was a lot on wwe's end and and bray wyatt's end you know creatively just not being able to find the right direction or whatnot or making some catastrophic mistakes but you know the other ones that they've tried haven't always been great but i really want this to be a success just for you know just for the tribute to bray wyatt you know bo dallas this seems to be important to him. This is something that he's going to want to do for his brother. And I hope it works out for him. I hope it works out as well for him as it did for Charlotte when she became a wrestler to fulfill her brother's dream. So hopefully Bo Dallas can find similar success. I hope that he can, but it's going to be hard to judge anything until we see, you know, Uncle Howdy back and what Uncle Howdy is going to be doing and how much of this is going to be a tribute or a reference to Bray Wyatt. Uh, I guess we'll, uh, we'll wait and see there. Um, but the big news last night on SmackDown was involving the bloodline. So we had the bloodline promo last night. Paul Heyman is out there with Solo Sokoa and Jimmy, and Heyman admits that Roman was distracted by his lust for revenge on Seth Rollins, and Cody is the one that was focused. Cody was the one that came prepared, and Cody was the one that was ready. And it's because of that that Cody is now the world champion, WWE champion, and Paul Heyman admitted this. And then he starts to talk about Roman Reigns, and he said, but then, like a phoenix, you're tribal chief. And then he's interrupted by Solo Sokoa, who stops him. And Solo says, uh, winning and losing matters. There are consequences for losing, right? And Paul Heyman goes, yeah. So, I mean, there are consequences for losing. There always was in the bloodline, although Solo's lost a bunch. So he hasn't suffered that hard consequences since he's been you know, since he's lost, but Heyman, you know, then agrees that when you lose, there are consequences. So then Solo turns his direction, turns his attention, I should say, to his brother, Jimmy, who's in the ring and uh, gives him a big hug. And he says, I love you. And then he takes a step back and Jimmy is attacked from behind by a hooded figure, starts putting the boots to Jimmy, reveals the hood to be Tama Tonga which I don't know what WWE is thinking here. No video package for this guy. Who is this guy? How am I supposed to know who he is? Why am I supposed to care? Oh my God, WWE's in the mud. No, I'm kidding. Uh, Tama Tonga attacks. I watched the YouTube clip of this uh, because I, for the life of me, I could not find a decent illegal stream for SmackDown last night because on the West Coast, I have to wait till 8 p.m. to watch SmackDown on Fox. It doesn't air locally or live. So I was trying to find a stream so I could watch it. And by the time I got one that worked, I, the Bloodline segment was already over. So I had to uh, watch it on YouTube. And when I watched it on YouTube, the fans reacted to Tama Tonga, but I think they might have been piped in. So I don't know what kind of a like on-air reaction he got. 
But that's just going to be natural anyway. Fans will get to know him, and they're going to do a good job of telling you who he is on WWE here, you know, in the next you know few weeks on TV. So he was uh, attacked by Tama Tonga. Paul Heyman looks freaked out. He's like standing on the ropes, kind of scared about it. And then they go to commercial, they come back, and Paul Heyman is coming out of the trainer's room checking on Jimmy, and he's immediately confronted by Tama, who gets right in Heyman's face and kind of like sniffs him up and down, and Solo goes up to him and kind of just go, does like this and walks away, and Heyman's like, what the hell does that mean? You know, so Heyman is uh, kind of going through it right now, and it looks to me like Solo, this to me felt like, what DX did the night after WrestleMania 14 when Shawn Michaels lost the title and Triple H came out and he formed the DX army and the ball is in his court. And what was the first thing he did was bring out one of his, uh, uh, one of his friends. You look to your blood. You remember you look to your friends and he brings out X Tonga, X Pac, <laughs> Tama, Tama Pac comes out. So Triple H and X-Pac kind of gave me, or I should say Solo and Tama gave me Triple H and X-Pac vibes from 1998, which I thought was kind of cool. So it sounds like Solo is picking up the ball and running with it, and he's going to take over the bloodline. He's the new tribal chief. Roman Reigns is out, and they have kicked out Jimmy Uso. And now it's just him and Tama Tonga. Well, Jacob Fatu is already signed. So I think it's likely that he's going to join up with them. And I hope that he does because Jacob and Tama Tonga are Haku and Tama's sons. Haku and Tama, the Islanders, one of my favorite teams as a kid. I used to love them when they were baby faces. I'll never forget when Bobby Heenan joined up with them and they turned on the Can-Am connection, this whole thing on TV. And I always loved the Islanders growing up. And Jacob Fatu is, uh, Ta- is actually Tama's son and Tama Tonga is Haku's son, it gets confusing. But if Jacob and Tama Tonga teamed up at any point in WWE and had a tag team, I would love that. I'm like, that's the Islander's sons. And I'm trying to think of tag teams where the siblings of the tag teams became tag team partners. Has that ever happened before? It might have. It might have. I don't know who it would be with, though. Shit, I have to do some thinking there. But that's interesting to me. So I feel like when Jacob Fatu comes in, he'll already be signed. Or uh, he'll uh, when he comes in, he'll be teaming up with them, most likely. And then you're going to kind of have maybe a Bloodline 2.0 or two camps of the Bloodline. You know, now that Jimmy is kicked out, he can maybe reunite with his brother Jay. And then when Roman comes back, you got that original bloodline back together. You know, you could bring Sami Zayn back into it. And then you still got uh, Tonga Loa out there, right? And who else? There's another one. There's like still two more that I think you could bring in. I forget the other one's name, but, you know, maybe you bring in another name. That way Sammy can join back up. But I still think that would be a mismatch. If this is what they're going to do, you know, Bloodline 2.0, granted, there's a lot of time until Survivor Series to to, to build, uh, you know, to build these stars up. But I feel like Roman and the Usos and Sammy would destroy Solo and Tama and Jacob and whoever else they fucking have. So we'll see how that develops. But if the Bloodline is split in two, you know, and how The Rock fits into this, that's all interesting. And I'm glad that this saga is entering its next chapter because we knew eventually more family members would start turning up. We knew at some point Roman was going to have to drop the title. We knew at some point Roman's probably going to go back to being a baby face. This is probably all part of that. And Roman now is going to start his whole new story, you know, and with the bloodline. And it should be pretty fun. I'm excited to to see how it plays out. So that was SmackDown last night in a nutshell. Pretty eventful show because we got big bloodline news and we have Cody's challenger all but confirmed for backlash. So the business never stops. It was a busy, crazy WrestleMania week and WrestleMania weekend. But then we dive right back in to more stuff this week and it's just never ending. So it was fun to talk about this stuff with you guys today. Thank you for being here. We'll hang out in the chat, answer some more questions, and I'll see if there's anything else left in my notes that I did omit. Uh, I don't have anything written down for Raw this week, so I haven't gotten a Raw review. 
All right, I've not, I haven't gotten a raw preview for you yet, but we'll be here on Monday night to talk about it anyway. So there you go. Okay, so Alexa Bliss and Carmella, they are both uh, recently, recent mothers. Alexa did have her baby. Uh, so I don't know if she'll be involved in that or not, but when it said, you know, you forgot about us, I'm like, well, who else could be us? I mean, unless Uncle Howdy's going to be showing up with all those Firefly Funhouse, you know, characters. And I'm curious if we're going to see that Firefly Funhouse set on camera again. Like if Uncle Howdy will ever do anything with the Funhouse set. I don't even know. It's going to be weird to see all that again. <laughs> Holly's 40. Who's Holly, Juliet? Yo, Ronnie. Good to see you, man. Oh, yeah. Got something for you. Reading some more here. Yeah, there you go, JJ Leg. Hook in NXT, Taz on NXT commentary, and coach. That wouldn't be bad. That wouldn't be bad at all. Black Rain. No, what is it with you guys and casual fans? People like Black Rain 7920. I'm begging you to have an original thought. I'm begging. Do you think any casual fans know who Tama Tonga was? Do they? No. <laughs> so what the fuck is your point? Black Rain. It's stupid comments like that. It'll just make me remove you and hide you from the channel so you can't comment here anymore because we don't like dumbasses. And you are one. Yeah, Nate Dog. I just said that. Triple H dropping it to Hogan. Wasn't that shit in 2002 weird? Triple H wins the title, triumphant return at the Royal Rumble, wins the Rumble after his injury, then goes on, wins the title in the main event. Oh, Hogan's here. You're going to have to pass that to him now. That was so shitty. I was mad. I was mad about it. I didn't like that he dropped the title. Oh, Def, oh, Def Rebel's got a 10-year contract. Ironclad. Nothing's ironclad. WWE will always have an out. There's a... I don't... I, I can't imagine WWE signing an ironclad contract to a... to an in-house music producer. You can find a million of those. That's crazy. Yeah, they are not very good. At all. Oh, I see. There you go. Yeah, Juliet, you're probably right. Thank you for the two bucks. Solo took control with The Rock's blessing. Because that's right, because I think, uh, didn't Thomas say um, it was uh, by orders of the tribal chief? Well, Roman didn't order that. Oh, and I forgot to mention, too, after they beat down Jimmy, Heyman wanted to do his call Roman Reigns thing, and Solo took the phone out and stomped it. So I forgot about that. That's awesome. So it wasn't Roman Reigns. It might have been The Rock that did it, and I love that. I hope it is The Rock. I hope The Rock is the one calling the shots from his private plane. Do this, do that. And that means Rock can kind of get involved in this. You know, maybe The Rock can be in war games. Imagine adding Rock and Cody both to the mix. Maybe Cody and Sammy join Roman in the Usos, and it's five of them, five on five. And then over on the other side, it's you still got to find one more over there. You'd have The Rock joining up with those guys. That would be a lot of fun. Rock in a War Games match. Could you even imagine? Rock in a War Games match with a crimson mask. Could never even... My brain can't even process that that visual. Ask uh, ask AI to make it that one. Because that's nuts. Yeah. That, I guess that all depends on, you know, what Alexa Bliss wants to do and if she is uh, going to be planning for a comeback or maybe getting herself back in shape now. You can start the process of the storyline with whatever she's going to be involved in. And plus, you know, she would have some time, you know, to get in ring shape because this is something that might take a long time for her and Uncle Howdy or either one of them to actually have a match in the ring. Uh, and that, That's a big part of what Triple H said in the Bray Wyatt documentary is, you know, regardless of how good these characters might be, and how cool they might be. Like, how does it translate to the ring? So whatever they're doing with Uncle Howdy, that's got to translate to the ring somehow. So hopefully uh, they, you know, it might, it might even be a benefit to not have Bray Wyatt's influence there on creative on this because he seemed to handcuff himself a lot. So we'll see. I just hope it's good. 
you know, I do. I hope I hope the best for uh, the Uncle Howdy character and, and the Jack Perry character. With whatever they're doing here, I hope it works out for both because uh, that just makes more exciting content for us to consume as fans. So, anywho, I got to wrap it up here. I got to now head to work, uh, and then it'll be my weekend, and then I'll be back here uh, with you guys tomorrow night. Don't forget, tomorrow night we're going to be watching WCW Uncensored 1995, and I got a lot of memories of this because I watched it in my room, in my parents' house, Two months before I graduated high school on a scrambled pay-per-view feed on a 19-inch Magnavox. So we're going to talk all about that tomorrow. It's going to be fun. Thank you so much for being here today. If for any reason there is any super chat or anything like that, I missed. I don't think there was, but if I missed one, I'm sorry. We'll get to it tomorrow. And uh, thank you so much for hanging out with us this afternoon. The audio of this podcast will be up, uh, pushed out to the podcast feed later tonight when I get home. So keep a lookout for that. Thumbs up button on the way out the door would be appreciative. And if you're not a subscriber, please become one. Have a great rest of your Saturday night, and I'll catch you tomorrow for the watch along. Peace.